Shipshape.pro, the number one resource in the U.S. for marine professionals. professionals. Today on the Shipshape podcast, we have Carl Blackwell. Carl Blackwell is the former president of Discover Boating, former CMO of the NMMA, and the two hosts today are Meryl Charette, I'm a liveaboard on a Toshang Toshiba 36 in Boston, Massachusetts, and Ali Wish. She is a liveaboard in Boston, soon to be in France. How are you doing today, Carl? Man, I am doing great. Uh, it's great to be talking to you guys. How would you exactly get into the maritime industry to begin with? Well, I, uh, first of all, I grew up boating and, you know, there's just something about uh, having that experience as a kid that kind of builds that uh, love for the water. I was working for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which nobody's heard of, but they may have heard of the campaign called Beef, It's What's for Dinner. And uh, I was working for them. I'd been there about um, eight years. I was running their uh, marketing for them and new products, believe it or not. And uh, I went to the doctor one day and he, uh, he looked at my uh, blood work and he said, what are you eating? And I'm like, well, uh, I have all these home economists that work for me. So I'm, I'm, they all have kids and they're all selling me Girl Scout cookies. So I'm eating Girl Scout cookies and beef. And that's about <laughs> it. And he said, well, you got to make a change there. So uh, I decided to look for a new job. And uh, fortunately, my timing was perfect because right around that time, the National Marine Manufacturers Association, the boating world, they're the association that represents boat manufacturers. They were looking to start their own uh, national consumer marketing campaign. So my timing couldn't have been better. And so when I uh, I saw an ad, I mean, who sees an ad anymore in a, in a newspaper <laughs> even? Uh, I think that was the last time that I probably ever uh, looked at the help wanted ads in a newspaper. But a uh, tiny little ad uh, looking to start a, a national advertising campaign for, for boating. And I'm like, well, I mean, I grew up boating. I love boating. You know, I, I got to get out of beef. Maybe I'll eat a little bit more fish if I go to the boating industry. <laughs> I answered the ad and um, I had a lot of interviews. Uh, I interviewed with them, uh, the, the boating association, um, about seven times. I had interviews with um, board members. I had interviews with pretty much every staff member, counterparts. And, you know, I also was interesting. I interviewed with people that were going to report to me. So that's always kind of interesting because they're asking me questions like, are you going to be a tough boss? And (laughs) what do you say to to that? Uh, I'm going to be a fair boss. I'm not going to be a pushover. And they made me take psychological tests. I mean, I could have told them I was crazy. But um, eight hours of testing, and and I was starting to get a little frustrated. I'm like, all right, guys, you have to make a decision here because you're wasting my whole summer. I could be out (laughs) boating. And so they sat down, and they got it, gathered everybody in the room that talked to me, and they were trying to make the final decision. It was me and and another gentleman. And one of the uh, staffers who would have reported to me, who actually did eventually, said, you know, I don't know. I think we should go for the other guy. Carl's going to make us accountable. And I'm like, and the president, Tom Domridge, looked at her and said, well, that's exactly why we should hire Carl. So I have that former staffer to thank for saying that I would uh, make them accountable for my job within the boating industry. And I got to tell you, I'm so lucky. I'm lucky to work, uh, have worked in an uh, industry that I grew up, was passionate about, and I could do marketing. And that's really was my uh, professional passion. And um, so I started there in 2003. So Grow Boating and Discover Boating, you know, they've made a ton of impacts when it comes to bringing people into the maritime industry. So when you were coming in, what was the scene like for boating in general? There wasn't a Discover Boating campaign when I started. Well, I should say there was, but it was just a shell. It was a really bad website and a couple of brochures, and they did a couple of events. And um, they weren't reaching anybody, um, not anybody to speak of. And the industry had tried to actually start this three times, and then it could never come to consensus. At least they understood that they needed to have an umbrella campaign to get people interested and start it and replace all those people that were getting out of boating. And the industry was, you know, chugging along, doing okay. They weren't... uh, 
they weren't gaining a lot of customers, but they weren't lose, losing too many. So, I mean, I give them a foresight to actually, uh, you know, want to get out in front of this. So we did uh, a tremendous amount of consumer research, pulled together all the research that people had did, did in the industry. We got a lot of uh, consumer insights. And um, we actually based our pitch on the industry on that research. And it's hard to argue with research, facts and figures. And that's what was happening before. Everybody was arguing on opinions and not on facts. And so that was what we did differently this time. And sure enough, the industry voted unanimously to support the Discover Voting campaign. Everybody contributed and uh, off we were running. And so that first couple of years, I had uh, to uh, build a, a new website. That was back when DVDs and CDs were popular. So I had to create a CD to uh, that I could send out to people to get them engaged uh, and interested in voting. And what that also was for the voting industry, that was a lead generator. Hey, this person said, I want to get into voting. And so we captured their uh, information and uh, then we were able to connect them to um, boat manufacturers. And, um, and that actually gave the manufacturers some tangible benefit to keep them uh, interested in, in continuing to fund us. But uh, in 2005, we launched our first television ad campaign. We also had uh, big three-page spreads in uh, Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated. We uh, did a lot of uh, digital advertising. And you got to remember back in 2005, digital wasn't very big. And, uh, and off we went. And so... Uh, that's kind of how it started. It's really just getting everybody in the industry in a room and uh, pleading our case, and they all signed off on it. Very interesting. Well, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, it's sort of an internet trend, but it's how it started versus how it's going. We just heard how it started. How is it going now? How would you say, you know, things are current day? Well, in the beef industry, it was, we were federally mandated funding. Every time a head of cattle got sold, a dollar went into a pot, and that was federally mandated to be spent on marketing. There's a lot of uh, uh, commodity co-op programs out there that uh, are, you know, are, are done that way. Well, in the boating world, at any time, leaders of the industry could have said, we're not going to fund this anymore. We're, you're not doing a good job anymore, Carl. We, we we're pulling the plug. Well, that didn't happen, and it hasn't happened yet. Because, I mean, it's a voluntary thing, even though, you know, you have to contribute if you're a member of the National Marine Manufacturers Association. They, you know, the leaders could, you know, decide we don't want to do this anymore. So over the years, it's been doing really well. I will tell you, though, a couple of stories about the recession. You know, when the recession hit in 2007, boy, the bottom fell out of uh, boat sales. And boat manufacturers were pretty much stopped their lines. They were just trying to sell the inventory that was in the pipeline. And I remember one uh, significant boat manufacturer say to me, Carl, we've hit rock bottom. I no longer have any orders in my system. Mm -hmm. And this particular company just built a gigantic expansion. Uh, they invested millions of dollars and he had none, no, uh, uh, no bids. And so the, uh, the industry got together and said, listen, we've got some great momentum with Discover Voting, but we can't continue to fund it at the level we were. We're going to cut it back to a million dollars a year. All right, Carl, you got to keep the lights on with a million dollars a year. Now, that may sound like a lot of money, especially <laughs> back then, but for a national advertising campaign, that wasn't a lot of money. And so what we turned to, believe it or not, that kept us going was, A, we kept our website up, certainly. But we went to Facebook, this funny little social media company called Facebook. And we started to grow organically and we actually paid for uh, you know people to come to our page and start to interact with people. Because people didn't stop voting. We just stopped funding our advertising. I mean, in fact there was they didn't sell a lot of boats during that phase, but you know, people that owned those boats, that was their escape. And so we built this really strong Facebook community. We, we actually, at the time, I don't, I don't know if it still um, is this big, but we had over a million followers. And I know that was by far the largest uh, boating group on, in Facebook in the world. In fact, they did case studies on us. And um, during that uh, recession, we actually created a couple of games. We created uh, the first, um, what we called a movie maker, where you could download 
seven or eight photos from your outing on boats. And we created a, we would take that and create a video out of that. We would, we would, uh, we attach some music to it. And all of a sudden, uh, eight pictures, you would create a memory of your day on boating. We did a lot of different tactics like that. And so we decided to submit what we did in this case study to, um, the EFI organization. And that is one of the top advertising uh, groups that uh, offer awards. And, uh, but it's based on how effective you were. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ad campaigns out there that you can create a beautiful, pretty ad and it may not do anything, but the EFI campaign actually took into account all of the results from it. And we beat out everybody in the $1 million or less category in the world. The best advertising campaign under uh, under a million dollars. So that was one of my, uh, you know, you know, when the things get tough, you know, you, you get tougher. And uh, and I knew that at any point the boat manufacturers could kill this program, and I might be without a job. So I needed to make sure that uh, we kept uh, boating t- uh, front and center. And then fortunately, things like that, the economy started coming back, and off we run again. And we're uh, and the campaign's going strong to this day. Well, when you're talking about all of this, it sounds like an unbelievable amount of work. So, <laughs> you know, you totally had a team. How did you build out your team? Hey, I, we had a great group of staff. In fact, you know, some of those staff are still there. Some of them have moved on and they've turned out to be just superstars in the industry. Uh, and I, I would say probably one of my uh, most cherished accomplishments is uh, hiring a great group of people keeping them motivated and, and frankly, having them work on boating wasn't that hard. I mean, they, they love boating as well and just keeping them together and keeping them focused. And we did a lot of great things. And I could tell you about some of the things we did together, but we also hired a really strong uh, marketing agency at the time. I, uh, it was Olson. And, you know, when you surround yourself with good people, good things are going to happen. And I wasn't the kind of a leader that was worried about somebody taking my job. I mean, frankly, if somebody came in and took my job, I probably deserved to. But I thought, I said, I'm going to bring in good people, people that are smarter than me in these areas that I don't know all that about. And came in and shined and we, we built a great team. Again, one of my most cherished accomplishments. I've been very fortunate throughout my career of, of ha- being surrounded myself with very good people. So besides just pure luck, when it, what have you done or what did you do to build that team, you know, that you think brought out the best in the people of the industry to work so well with you? Well, you know, some of the things that I did, I never put myself above the fray. I was always in the trenches. I was never afraid to get in and do what they were doing or show them you know, how I, I have done it in the past. I mean, fortunately, when you grow up and you, I've been in marketing positions all my life, I, I got a chance to be a teacher now. And I, I really got a kick out of that. And so I would get in the trenches with these guys or we would find a problem and we would work it out together. And you got to recognize the folks too. And, you know, I had a great boss myself and Tom Domrick, who's a fantastic mentor and, uh, you know, just an incredible industry leader. And uh, he encouraged me to just just work with these folks hands on, make them know that you care about them, fight the fights with them. And I, I put a lot of, I put in a lot of hours. Unfortunately, I probably spent too many hours there, nine to nine every day. But um, you know, just simple things, get in the trenches with them, show them you care, let them come up with some ideas, don't smother them, uh, let their creative juices. You got to motivate them too. If you're going to hire smart people and turn them loose, you can't micromanage them. And because we had experts in different areas, I mean, one of the bigger challenges is making sure everybody got along and worked hard together. And I spent a lot of time, um, you know, trying to make sure everybody played nice in the sandbox. So I hired. Here's a here's a little tip. I hired smart. I, I hired ambitious people. But the secret ingredient was nice. They had to be nice. And if they were smart and they were ambitious, but they weren't nice, that created problems for me. So I had to bring, I had to bring in people that were nice. And that really just uh, enabled the success of the team. Now, did it work every time? And then there was a couple of people that snuck in that maybe uh, didn't fit very well. Uh, but um, 90% of the time, I, I, if they had those three traits, we were going to be successful. 
Now, when it comes to marketing in the maritime industry, and you're going to have to tell me if I'm wrong with this, but there is like a, you kind of need to know the language of boat in order to really be able to market and write content and, and all of that. So how did you, you manage that where a lot of these people coming in already boating, you know, at some point in their life or how did you educate that? Well, a lot of the types of skill sets that I was hiring for, especially early on, didn't exist out there in the industry. There weren't a lot of great websites. There weren't a lot of great, you know, advertisers, good PR people. So I had to actually um, take some of these people and um, with those great skill sets. And I had to be patient and teach them the boating industry. But I will tell you, I strived all the time to find a boating, that boating knowledge first and foremost, because it takes a good year to two. I mean, it's a two to year commitment, it's two, one to two year commitment to get people up to speed. And especially when it comes to contents, I hired, uh, like you're, you know, Ali, I mean, as you're writing content, you have, you're going to get called out if you don't know the right stuff about boating. You show the wrong picture, you use the wrong term in boating and the boaters, the boating industry will call you out. Boaters will call you out. Absolutely. So my content people were definitely uh, honed from uh, the, the boating world. And I'll throw out a little, uh, you know, the best person I ever hired was Kim Kodatek, who uh, was um, a content person for um, Boats.com. She came to work for me and she did a fabulous job. And now she's um, doing it for Boat Setter. But um, you know, content is a relatively new thought process. And it's so undervalued. I mean, the writers in this industry are so undervalued. I don't know how they, I don't know why those guys don't get paid twice as much as you do. Because you, what you do is valuable. I'm, I'm like, I pay those guys and we can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, people ought to pay for content. It's so important. Right? I, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny when you say they'll call you out if you say the wrong word. They'll call you out if you say the right word. It's just not the right word for them, right? Butters are extremely opinionated. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we always are on our toes. And believe me, we had to apologize. We had to go in and make edits constantly. And that's the beauty of, you know, digital world. We can make those changes pretty fast. So, you know, when it comes to Discover Boating, you know, before you left, how many did you ever come up with a statistic of how many people you actually got into the industry? Well, you know, data was hard to come by. I know that we uh, we were pushing in the latter parts, last 2019 or so, we were pushing two to three million people from our websites to boat manufacturer sites. And that's a lot of interested people. And if they drilled down on our side and got all the way to a boat manufacturer site, then they probably were pretty interested in boating. And we were putting in, uh, we were using cookies back at the time to try to figure out, you know, information about, not not personal information about them, but, you know, to really try to track where they went when they left our sites. Did they go to the boat buying section? But I mean, there was only so much we could do. But I will tell you, when people used to fill out lead forms, when they signed up for a DVD or they signed up for, for something, we could take that information and then scrape that against boater registration databases and what we found that 12% of the people that signed up for a DVD or a brochure on Discover Boating ended up buying a boat. Now that is one heck of a batting average, really, for a lead system. Uh, and that's what uh, you know kept the boat manufacturers and the dealers all behind us. And sometimes, you know, if they didn't sell, they, they didn't sell a boat themselves. Well, you know, they didn't know that that person went to our site always either. Because they weren't reporting their sales to us, but the Coast Guard and, you know, through a boater registration database was able to provide that to us. And, uh, and then we could just scrape those names against that. And we had a heck of a, heck of a run there. So uh, we sold boats. But our mission, though, was to sell boating. We, we needed to get people interested in boating. And we, we needed to get them on the water. We had to inspire them to get out on the water because you guys know this. If you get people on the water and they're they're enjoying a boat, they're uh, you know that, that's the strongest tool anybody has. That's what I love about this industry is we have this recreation that is so appealing. Uh, when I get people on my boat, when they step off the the dock and they step on the deck of my boats, they just change. Their whole demeanor changes. And then when I start to pull out of the harbor, I, I, I ask them, "How are you guys feeling now?" And they're like. 
man, we're on top of the world. We're happy. And it's just, you can see it because when you see them before on the dock, they're kind of uptight, stressed. And, or, and I did this with media a lot, you know, take them out, you know, they've got to worry about deadlines and uh, get them on the boat and they don't want to come back, you know, because they just love it out there. So there's magic, you know, boating's certainly magical. Yeah, so um, speaking about your boat, tell us a little bit more about that. That's your boat in the background, I believe. Yeah, that's my boat. I'm very proud of my boat. It's a uh, little cabin cruiser. I'm I'm on Lake Michigan in Chicago, and you kind of need a boat. um, Mine's 32 feet. You need need a boat that big to be able to kind of weather the winds and the waves and, and just be able to cut through the water pretty well. And I, it took me a year to name my boat because, you know, I'm president of Discover Boating. You know, I'm all about marketing the boating lifestyle. I can't just go with any boat, you know. And I come up, my friends were giving me a lot of uh, ideas, you know, some names that were probably a little R-rated or, you know. And I'm like, you know, I'm not going to go with that name. You know, I can't do that. And one name was, I thought was kind of funny. It was kind of named after, um, you know, a dog is your is man's best friend. Well, I kind of thought a boat was man's best friend. So that was going to be the name at one point. But um, so I, I would bring out a, a bottle of champagne every time we would go out. Just one bottle. And we were sitting around drinking that champagne one time. And a friend of mine asked me, you know, why the champagne, Carl? You know, why, why do you always bring a bottle of champagne every time we go out? And I said, you know, there's really no reason I mean, we're celebrating life. Life is good, man. We're on a we're on a boat, and <laughs> and then it then dawned on me the name is champagne for no reason. Champagne really being a cel- a, a symbol for celebration, and no reason means celebrate every day because you can go on a boat every day if you want. And so it just kind of stuck. Uh, champagne for no reason, and, and I've actually won a couple of contests for best boat names. And uh, this actually is my second uh, boat with that name. My first boat, uh, I made an agreement with the dealer that the, no- the name was going off the boat. I didn't want anybody else with that name. And I didn't really want to name my new boat Champagne for No Reason 2 because uh, the name's kind of long. And I didn't want to add any more words or symbols or anything. So, uh, But, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time on Champagne for No Reason. I love that. I love that story. How often do you uh, get to go out? I, I'm in a really great spot here in Chicago. I'm, I'm really close to Soldier Field. And there's also a, a little uh, island out there called Northerly Island. And there's a concert venue there. And uh, so I can get out to my boat. And I don't even have to leave the dock. I can sit there and listen to concerts. In fact, the Goo Goo Dolls are playing there tonight. And if I wanted to go listen to the Goo Goo Dolls, I could go down, open the boat up, crack open a beer or maybe a bottle of champagne and uh, listen to the uh, music without leaving my boat. And it's right in front of uh, the Burnham Park Yacht Club where uh, I'm a member. And uh, so it's so convenient for myself and my friends. So uh, I, I, I just spend a lot of time really right at the dock. And we have a whole community out there. And, and you, if you guys know, if your if boat's at a dock, it is a community and everybody helps each other. You could be a plumber or you could be an eye surgeon, but you're equal when you're on the boat or on the dock and everybody just helps everybody. And I just really love that about, you know, the boating community is we're all equal. We're, we're not pretentious. Well, maybe some people are, but not on my dock and we'll help each other out. In fact, we stay friends. We're in Chicago, so we can only boat five months of the year. So we stay friends year round. We really enjoy our company. Yeah, it's definitely a unique situation to be in and, you know, boat ownership and the relationships that you make, you know, it is a commonality. Like you run into some of the fanciest, richest people, but you have this commonality of boat. And so you just immediately bond. And, you know, that's one of the things that I've loved about it. Yeah, no, I think it keeps everybody at the same level, which is really important. You know, I think in the whole world, that would be lovely. <laughs> but boating does a really good job of exemplifying that. Absolutely. So, well, you know, you need help from people. Like, you know, how did you tie that knot? I mean, simple stuff like that. And I mean, it's a common thread through all boats. Or who do you call when uh, something's wrong with your windlass? Or, um, you know, <laughs> you clogged head for heaven's sakes, you know? You know, and if you're if you're a really rich super yacht guy or if you're, uh, you know, a little a tiny runabout, you know, you've got those issues. Uh, and so you can bond together. Yeah. So, what is, give me a good boating story. What is one of your favorite boating memories that you have? 
Wow. Well, yeah, I have. I'm, I make them every weekend. Uh, I try to at least. Uh, I could tell. Uh, I could tell you my worst day in boating. Oh, do it. Uh, yeah. I, I'm actually a little infamous for this. This is kind of embarrassing, but this is going to be now memorialized. But um, I was talking to a, a billionaire owner of a, a boat company one day. I was heading to the boat. I was trying to get out early on a Friday. So uh, he was yelling about to me about something, something that wasn't even my fault, but I had to take it anyway because he was a billionaire boat owner and he was a bully. And uh, you just did that with this gentleman. Uh, I bet there's people out there could probably figure out who I'm talking about. You've been around <laughs> here very long. And uh, so after I got done getting berated for an hour on the phone, I um, I had a flip phone at the time. And so I clapped the, I clapped the phone and I brought my elbow back and my elbow hit a pier or you know a pylon and it hit my funny bone and then my fo- my phone went flying out of my hand and I could see it you know 10 feet down in the water so I lost my phone and so that didn't and the day was just getting worse so I I, I had to, this time I was on a star dock which is sort of like a mooring um, um, a remote mooring and I had to row my boat out there to it so I rowed my boat out there got on the, got on the boat and I needed to check my engine room to see, um, to check something in the engine. And I got down there and, and the engine in this case was, it was a 26 C ray. So I had to get down into the belly of the boat and the uh, hydraulic lift, something snapped in it and it came crashing down and it left me about two or three inches of air. So now I'm stuck in this hydraulic, uh, you know, in this room with a hydraulic lift attached so I couldn't lift it and push it back up. I want a mooring, remember, so there's not a lot of people around there. And it's a hot summer day without my phone. And so I'm like, oh boy, what am I going to do? And I'm like, well, it's a Friday. I hope I have some friends coming out here on this Friday afternoon. So I'm down there for a while and I found this metal bar and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to take my shirt off. I have a white shirt on. So I'm going to try to bend this bar Stick it out of that three-inch gap. I'm going to try to hold it up and wave the white flag when boats are driving by. So I did that for about two hours. I'm hot down there. You remember, I'm in an engine room, and, and I'm trying to wave the white flag. And, of course, nobody could see it because I could barely get it over the wall. And so I thought, what am I going to do? Am I going to have to put a hole in the side of this boat and, and this fiberglass to get my way out of here? Am I, I'm going to die in the bottom of this boat? So finally, a friend of mine came over uh, on a star dock, one away, and I, I heard him uh, working on his boat. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. And finally, he says, Carl, is that you? And I'm like, yes. And he can't see me, of course. I said, help. So he, he had to row his boat over to me. And uh, fortunately, he got me out. The end of that story. I thought I was going to die on a, on a hot summer day in Chicago. So I row my boat back in, I uh, get in my car. I uh, throw my T-shirt and my keys in the front seat. I go around back and uh, shut the trunk. And I realize I had locked my keys in the car with my shirt in there. <laughs> and I had no keys. I had no phone. And I am really sweaty and smelly. And some girls walked by and they I, they took pity on me. They were leaving. I said, could you, I'll sit in your trunk. I'll sit in the back of, of, of your car can you give me a ride to my house? I don't have any money. I don't have a driver's license. I don't have a phone. I don't have a shirt. I stink. So they take me uh, to my place, my condo. Fortunately, they were they're, they're, they took pity on me. Um, they were kind of cute, and I would have probably hit on them, but I knew they weren't interested in me. So I go to my, go to my door, man. He buzzes me in, and, and then I saw I, I'm shirtless. I stink. And he looks at me like, you can't walk in the lobby because I'm in a high rise. You can't walk in the lobby without your shirt on. And so I said, don't start with me. I'm walking in this lobby. I'm going up to my condo. And I don't care if I'm shirtless. So that's the end of my terrible day. Uh, I took it. I went down and apologized to the doorman for yelling at him. But um, that's my worst day in boating. I mean, uh, and my friends and my colleagues will will talk about the time that I got stuck in the engine room all the time. And now, now more of them will. That, that is a great story. I need to compose myself. <laughs> that would have been uh, quite a interesting end for, you know, the founder, president of Grow Boating and Discover <laughs> Boating. Yeah. <laughs> that thought did go through my mind. I, but the, the I guess the benefit was there was I wasn't going to have to tell the story because I wouldn't have been there to tell it. <laughs> but uh, 
because I always think about all the sound bites I'd have to come up with to try to explain this. But it happened uh, about 15 years ago. So, you know, I haven't done it again, but I won't go in my engine room without making really darn sure the uh, the lift's not going to break on me. How long were you actually trapped in the bowels of the boat? I was there for two hours. And I knew I could probably bust into the water tank if I needed water. <laughs> I mean, who wants to drill a hole in your own water tank, you know? <laughs> and, um, I had, I think I had one tool, which was a hammer with me that I could reach as I was, you know, with that three inch gap. So I mean, I really was thinking about busting a hole through the side of the boat, but then I might think my luck was I probably would have created a leak and then I would have been a bigger problem. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Well, you might save someone's life someday by sharing that story. So, <laughs> you know, that's how I tell There you go. <laughs> so getting back to the, the maritime industry, you know, how has the dynamics of the industry changed since you came in in the early 2000s compared to what it is now? Well, you know, there's been a lot of consolidation in a lot of niches. I mean, when I first started, there were, and there still are, there were like a thousand boat brands. I mean, I don't know how many car brands brands there are, but they're probably only, you know, 30 or 40 that really make any kind of volume of boats. And the boating industry, there were a ton of uh, brands out there, small little brands serving small little niches. So there there wasn't a lot of money to spend on research and development and new technology. Basically, they were just trying to keep the doors open by building a few niche boats. Uh, And then we started to see a little bit of consolidation. And, uh, And so then that enabled these companies to afford to do a little research and development uh, and create some more synergies and, you know, think out of the box a little bit. And you're see- you've seeing that obviously with Brunswick and, and some of the other companies out there that are, that are buying it. And, and, and now you're starting to see, you know, uh, two or three brands, you know, team up and work together because they have to be, to be competitive. And so you see that in the Marina world, uh, you see a couple of big companies emerging and, and buying up Marina's, uh, you see that in the dealer world, you know, because uh, there's we just need to be able to afford some efficiencies out there. If the world's going to and our world is going to evolve, you've got to be able to afford that research and development and making those investments. Uh, so I think that's a good thing for the industry. And it's not something that anybody should fear. You know, it, it really they embrace it. And so that's, yeah, that's one thing that I think uh, is happening. And I also should mention that's happening in the boats and assess, uh, an accessory community as well. The accessory guys are starting to uh, consolidate a little bit more. And um, I really do think that's positive. And, and there's not enough business to go around for the number of brands that there used to be. We just need consolidation. I also think that big data is finally reaching boating. boating. We need to take the data out there that the automobile guys have embraced and apply some of that stuff or just apply our own data. Just come up with data and and make boating easier for people. You know, people don't have a lot of patience these days. I mean, and you guys are sailors and you understand that full well that, you know, that takes a lot of time and effort to to sail. And, you know, the, the younger adult or the older adult really doesn't want to, you know, spend that time and energy to do that. So I think you're seeing boating made easier and that's got to continue. And I, and I think that there's there's companies out there today that do boat monitoring that can monitor all the systems within your boat. So you've got a smart boat and that's going to help the consumer know when, hey, there's there's trouble coming. I mean, in the past, I know on my boat, I, if my impeller needed to be replaced, I didn't think about it until it went bad. Today's technology, I'm going to get a warning before it goes bad, and I'm going to be able to solve that before I get out on the water and my boat gets overheated. Uh, and I could think of a thousand different applications there with, with with having good data on your boat. And you know, some of the some of the websites that are springing up to help with service. Service is key to loyalty, and that'll drive people out of boating. If you don't have a good source for service or you're not getting good service, you know, that nothing's going to drive you out of boating faster. Uh, and I think the industry has recognized that and are and trying to um, address the service issue as well. That's so important to our industry. And, you know, the boat doesn't have to stand for break out another thousand. Really, I would like boat to stand for best of all times. Um, <laughs> we've got a ways to go. 
But uh, I see those as trends emerging that I think are really going to come to the forefront. Now, you're also considered a master networker in the maritime space and the social dynamics of, you know, people in in this industry are, are, I feel like, unique. Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, when I first started in the industry, I was an outsider. I came from the beef industry. What's that got to do with boats? Other than they both start with a B, you know, there's nothing in there. So one thing I did really early on in my career was um, I bought a boat because I felt like I needed to uh, bond with people and uh, having that boating knowledge, that really accelerated my boating knowledge. I mean, we had a company boat at NMMA and I took advantage of that as often as I could. I learned to drive the boat and I did a lot of the maintenance myself, but Inevitably, all the good weekends, the president would take the boat out and I would be stranded somewhere. And so I said, I got to have my own boat. So uh, I went and bought my boat and my, my learning curve just skyrocketed. And now I was one of them. I was one of the other people in the industry. And I don't think it's as bad today, but I'll tell you back in 2003, if you weren't a boater or you didn't have a connection to the boating, it took you two or three years to break in. And I don't know, you guys are a little newer to boating than I am. I don't know if you faced the same uh, experiences that I did back then, but oh, I'll let you answer that. I think I'd be interested to hear what you guys. Uh, uh, well, I, I can say that, um, I mean, I got into the boating industry in around 2010, I want to say. Uh, I've been a live aboard for about 10 years and I'm about to leave living aboard for a while, moving on to land, which I described, I think in my last piece is like, I feel like I'm like cutting my arm off and swimming across the ocean to France. This is not an easy transition, but I feel like I'm finally at a place in my career where I don't have to be a live aboard or own this boat to be taken seriously. So I can relate to what you're saying. For a long time, it was like if I didn't own a boat or I wasn't living on a boat, my opinion was sort of less valid. Like I didn't know what I was talking about. How could I? And then, you know, my side of things, like coming into the industry, I had a lot of good advisors. So not only did I build a general contracting company, so I had to wrangle a bunch of harbor pirates to basically you know, accept the jobs that I gave them. But I also did chartering with this guy that, you know, pretty much in Boston, he would be like the Lord pirate. And he had such a attitude. He was one of the meanest people I ever met, but it taught me really how to like communicate with other people because maritime is full of extremes, right? And everyone is like, has this unique perspective and you know, just learning how to communicate effectively to, you know, be taken seriously. I never really had too much difficulty with that. I will say that uh, coming into the space and, you know, kind of what I'm doing is innovation. There's some people that like innovation and are working towards that and will help you out. But there are other people that are just, you know, too busy with the other things that they got going on that, you know, they're less forward thinking, I guess. Considering most of our demographic are people that didn't necessarily grow up with, most of my demographic, at least for the magazines, are people that didn't grow up with the internet and stuff like that. It's um, it's a difficult transition. But I think what Meryl is saying, like it completely overlaps with marketing too. Because it's like, how do you get these people in to what you're trying to share without offending them or making them feel comfortable and not like you're beyond what they're capable of sort of understanding? Well, you know, I think it takes an open mind too. If, if, If somebody's coming into the industry, you know, with discipline, marketing disciplines, you know, and that are really good. You know, they just have to um, be patient. I mean, their skills are needed. We need their skills in our industry. There are nuances that aren't obvious to in our industry that they've got to pick up on. I mean, one of the things I tell young people when they, they get into the industry, I'm like, shut up and listen. <laughs> now, they could be really smart, but just shut up and listen for 90 days. Ask questions. Be curious. Uh, Because you're going to be a hell of a lot smarter in this industry in 90 days than you are going to be in day one. And I don't care how talented you are. 
And so, but you know, Meryl, I've watched you and, and, and your career and, you know, I really admire the networking that you've been able to do and people can do that. You know, people out there in the industry, us old hags or what do you want to call us? Um, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we, we want to help you, you know, I mean, we like to, we like to talk and we like to help people. And I always encourage people to get out and ask network because I think people, you know, it's human nature. They want to help. They want to pass their knowledge along, especially, especially at older ones. You know, we definitely, because we don't have anything to lose, you know, let's just, let's just pass our knowledge along to people. And I really encourage people to network. You know, now you've got these wonderful tools like LinkedIn and you, you've you got all these other you know, ways to network with people. And I encourage you to do it, to pick up the phone and call. I mean, I do think people have kind of forgotten the, um, the habit of picking up the phone and calling. Nothing establishes a relationship faster than a phone call or what we're doing today with Zoom. You know, get on a Zoom call with somebody and, you know, you're going to bond. I mean, I, there's a couple of people I've been talking to here recently. I, I spent an hour with them. You know what? They call me up again. I'm going to talk to them and I'm going to help them. And whatever I do for them, it's never going to come back to me, but it's good karma. And so I, I really appreciate people that are brave enough to pick up the phone and call and, and talk to people. Because I really do think they'll, um, they'll, they'll help you. I couldn't agree with you more. I do think picking up the phone is terrifying, personally. <laughs> I hate doing that. But when I do, I end up having two hour long conversations. If they're in the boating industry, usually, you know, it starts off about something professional. And then we're telling our story about how we got stuck, you know, in the bilge of the boat for four hours or it, and it drags on and on, but it's, that's how you build connections. And I feel like, and that's how you build a network. So as we start to wrap this up, what would be your best piece of advice that you've gotten in the maritime industry and the best piece of advice that you've gotten outside of the maritime industry? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I told you I went when I went and bought a boat, I, I'm pretty sure somebody told me to, to get in the industry because I was asking, I'm like, how do I break in? How do I break through? And these old salty dogs, you know, they don't want to talk to me. And I got a pretty important job to do and I need to talk to them. And um, it was probably Tom Domrick who told me that, uh, you know, you, you got to just you got to become one of them. Uh, and, you know, Tom is a, a great leader and great mentor. And you got to seek those people out and stay, stay in touch with them. So I, I, I would do that. So I, I would say that's part of what I learned in the industry. You know, I'll give you a piece of advice that find balance. Uh, I worked a lot of hours in my career. And um, but at the end, I was burnt out, though I'm not done. I mean, I, I, I took a little sabbatical and I'm back now, but I took a little sabbatical. And I was burnt out. And it was because uh, I just didn't take the time to find balance. So that's important. You don't have to work nine to nine every day. Your staff doesn't want to work nine to nine every day. So remember that you're in boating and practice what you preach. Get out there and and boat. Um, And a couple other little pieces of advice I'd give uh, younger people today. And it goes to that relationship building skills. I I told you one of them, pick up the phone and call them because you, you just, that's much stronger than texting or emailing. Take an improv class. How about that for advice? Have some fun. Take an improv class. Take an acting class. Because that's going to make you a better public speaker. And, and that's going to take away that shyness that you might have. Uh, and make you a little bit more confident. And have fun doing it. I mean, I, I took a lot of public speaking classes. None of them really stuck until I took an improv class. Decided to have a little fun. And to be able to talk out, off the cuff. And so I highly encourage people to do that. And another thing that I would do to make you think strategically, play chess. I could play chess before I was six years old. Uh, I did that before I could read. Uh, now, it takes, a, it takes a long time to play chess well. So maybe there's something else today digitally that, that you could play that would teach you strategy. My point is, is that chess enables you to think two or three steps down the, the road and makes you think about the different paths that you can take. Because there's a lot of paths you can take. There's a lot of paths to victory you can take. And just think through each step in that path and what makes the most sense for you. So anyway, maybe there's another game out there that's a little more practical than chess. But um, think about that. I heard uh, Wordle is pretty popular right now. Yeah, I I thought it was 
pretty funny the the improv <laughs> section i i was coming from stand up comedy at one point and so i've gone booed off the stage a good bit you know pretty much more <laughs> more than you know claps so you know i got used to talking and being you know on the hot seat uh, well we both come from creative background i was a playwright but I didn't have to get on stage. This is as close to on stage as I'll ever be. And it's um, terrifying. <laughs> I just took the classes. I never had the guts to go and perform. So you you went further, Meryl. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I didn't take a class and that was abundantly clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was great talking to you. And, um, you know, where can people kind of find out about you or or hear what you're doing or follow you yeah well i have a pretty big uh, linkedin following so you can find me on linkedin uh, i do have a twitter i haven't been using it much lately uh but you can find me there as well but uh linkedin and uh, i i did uh, just start a new job i came out of retirement it hasn't been announced yet so um you'll have to follow me on linkedin to figure out where but it, it is a job that it inspired me to retire from retirement. So it had to be something pretty good. And it enabled me to really, I wanted to make a difference in the industry. And boating has been on fire the last couple of years. But that now there's a challenge of keeping people in boating. So it has something to do with retention. And it's something that I studied a lot when I was in my job. And now I'm going to pour myself into this. And I'm really looking forward to uh getting back in the industry um so i'll be talking to you guys often are you afraid of shark no not really Uh, no there's no sharks out in you know those great lakes right you know what i tell people that sometimes and it's it's pretty funny that some people actually believe me but um no i I mean i swim i mean i'm not gonna jump in with a hammerhead swirling around you know with a bloody leg or anything but uh (laughs) I, i i love wildlife i'm fascinated by fish and wildlife, and uh, certainly uh, I'm fascinated by sharks. <laughs> so your Great standards, question. Are, your standards are pretty low. Like, you're not going to jump in with a bloody leg. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> well, it was amazing to talk to you, Carl. Yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure, guys. Thank you. Check back every Tuesday for our latest episode and be sure to like, share and subscribe to ShipShape.pro.